our next map is is really incredible and it really captures i think the vivacity and vibrance of a of, of a region of the world that's really known for it talk us talk to us through uh this map that is rio yeah so rio another map we wanted to do for a long time we have several artists on the team that that spent a part of their life there mm -hmm. so it's pretty fun to kind of dive in and see this overwatch version of rio the, the beautifully painted favelas colorful vibrant club you get to visit where lucio's club is um the team loves going to brazilian barbecue so one of the spawn rooms is a brazilian barbecue place you know it's another map we're just having a lot of fun creating different details and and, and this aspirational version of this location for overwatch 2 and it's a, a a brand new payload here too you guys saw earlier it's a pretty fun carnival float uh, so we're just having fun with these maps we've been the cool brazilian barbecue it's uh fun and sunny and colorful and i think it's a, a map that feels like overwatch when you play it you know I mean, already that sort of signature vibrance that, you know, so many of, uh, you know, Overwatch's maps have been credited for is there. Can you, uh, obviously, I don't want you to give away too much, too much of the story, but is there a context here? Like wh where are the attackers starting from? Because I see some beach, I see different landscapes sort of getting fleshed out here as we go through the map. Okay, so the defense actually starts in Lucio's home. So... Yeah, obviously Ooh. there's a story layer to Overwatch that we want to tell. So mm -hmm. Lucio plays a big part of that. So uh, you get a little hint of where we're going with that, but we're not talking too heavily about it. Also, Lucio's club is always, it's kind of a community place. So it's a place, and if it was real, people can come there for free. He, he's a community guy. We wanted to showcase this with this gigantic kind of sci-fi club he has. Um, yeah, it's it's connected to the story of Overwatch. Uh, you, we'll just have to wait and see how closely Rio plays into the game. You saw a little bit at BlizzCon a while ago, but um, there's definitely more. Right, so, this... yeah, so I uh, I do have a question for Jeff. Sorry to cut you off, uh, Mitch, but I do have a question if that's fine. So if I'm pretty sure like way back in the day, there was like an interview that I read that was like, Five was too small and seven was too big for, yeah, for the yeah. for the roster limit, and then six was perfect. But like, I'm kind of curious, like where along, like the Overwatch timeline, did that philosophy kind of change? Like, was it roll lock? Was it like people sure. learning how to play the game better? Like, you, you know what <laughs> I mean? Pretty much every, all of this. Yeah, I mean, it's. I mean, we know so much about the game. I mean, as kind of Aaron touched on at the beginning, like before everything and you could just play five winstons in fact we had an internal tournament where that was yeah. the <laughs> strategy five winstons and a zenyatta it was sort of like oh my god this seems like maybe a problem or is this cool we don't know uh so like obviously when you're building really any game you try to make the best judgments for what you have and what you're playing but once you have the game in the wild you get everybody else's hands and it marinates for a while and you're making changes like your opinion on this stuff definitely changes so i think over time um like it was touched on, we, we were still keeping an open mind to maybe doing some of these kind of changes, and then coming Overwatch 2, we were just like, let's revisit everything. And that was definitely one of the major core decisions of Overwatch 1 we were really looking forward to revisiting. And at that point, we were just like, yeah, maybe this is actually just much better. Maybe we were wrong all along. Although, the people always say, uh, it's kind of a design thing, people say, you're not necessarily wrong at the time just because you were wrong in retrospect. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So obviously this is a hybrid battle. I don't know if I mentioned that at the beginning here. So um, much in the same way as King's Row, we'll be fighting for control of a payload here, which will eventually roll on out. And we kind of teased, uh, yeah, so uh, these payloads. This is, I mean, I'm no stranger to peacocking. Look at what I'm wearing. But this is uh, this is great. Obviously, we, we tell a story in Overwatch in the in, you know, in Overwatch 1 with, with these payloads here. So looking forward to seeing how that story gets fleshed out. What I'm seeing already is real difference in uh, map geometry, right? As we move into the second phase, all of a sudden it's less about chokes and overpasses, and it's just this, 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 this jumble of all these buildings and so much high ground here. Really feel like yeah. the way you play the map changes drastically here. Yeah, that, that was. Oh, you can go uh, ahead. Oh, that was just one thing we're we're trying more of this phased approach with the visuals and the gameplay as we move through the space. So you saw it was a bit more open. As you get the payload, there's a feeling of change in gameplay and art as well. So this visual progression as, as well as gameplay is much more clear in some of the newer maps we're working on. Yeah, one thing that I, maybe it's just the, 
maybe it's just a coincidence, but I feel like a lot of uh, a lot of chokes in 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 Overwatch One, like specifically, like I think like Hanamura first or like going through King's Row second, they're very like tight and like it's like perfect for like a Reinhardt shield to spread across, and it can be like you know a real pain to get through those sometimes because you feel like you really only have like one way to go through. But I'm seeing at least in the other two maps that we looked at a lot more. Uh, a lot more flanks and ways to access the point and I think that's overall better for the design because I feel like we especially on Hanamura first like going through that choke is kind of you know it, it can be a real it can be real not fun sometimes if, if, you, if you're just not clicking or if it's just you know they have a, a hard comp that that yours can't counter and I think it's just better overall yeah if we want to give players more options to solve a problem say they're stuck at the choke they have a few more options to break through, basically. They, they don't have to rely fully on the tank powering through this time. But yeah, that's that's always the thing. We're trying to improve the options the players have to solve situations. Are there going to be previous maps in Overwatch 1 that will be reworked, or...? Uh, we don't know Can yet. you not say? Is that secret? No. Or... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Okay, fair enough. So obviously, you look. You've got you've got one less hero on the battlefield. Uh, your, your maps are much more uh, labyrinthine, I guess, or just bigger, right? It's just a large, you know. There's so much more ground you could cover if you wanted to take a different approach. Uh, how do you sort of balance how big the map is, right? Because obviously, there's a sense where, like, you know, it, it, if you go too far in one direction, right, it can seem quite barren. But here, like everything, there's attention to detail everywhere, right? There's so many crisscrossing ways of approaching the point. Mm -hmm. Um, so it doesn't feel big, but it, it definitely, uh, as opposed to maps we saw in, in, in Overwatch in, on live right now, it definitely feels bigger, right? Is that ever a consideration trying to balance that, the sort of size and the majesty of it all? Uh, yeah, it, it's definitely more detailed than before. And again, the more options, the, there's more passageways and buildings for players to, to move through and build strategies from, but ultimately the maps are in a fairly similar size to the previous you're just seeing a lot more detail out of mm -hmm. the overwatch 2 engine we have a lot of cool upgrades that allow us to do more while keeping a smooth performance but yeah it's something we're constantly playing with us at the scale of maps and and how it feels to move through the space visually as well as gameplay wise this really has like a dorado feel almost right we have sort of payloads that are moving through underneath and there are yeah. there are multiple levels here this is not just sort of two levels here you can there's even more options i guess to sort of make use of this verticality mm -hmm. yeah there's like I love a left high ground right high ground there's so much going on here <laughs> yeah. i love this it, point in particular like taking that middle high ground is you know really important if you can hold it it's a fantastic but it's just really hard to hold because you have all these upper flank routes and under flank routes and stuff so uh, it's, it ends up being like kind of a gambit to try to even take it and hold it, especially mm -hmm. when you don't have tanks that can just sit on it with barriers all the time. Um, but <laughs> it's so powerful. You can see where Widow is right there. It's so powerful. You have this line of sight on everything up there. So is, with... is, uni is Universal ult charge nerfed, or is it just as a result of the tank changes that it seems like people are getting their ult slower? It's mostly just the tanks, and we don't have... Mm. They're probably... I can't remember exactly all the individual changes, but I think we probably adjusted a few heroes here and there. Um, may have gone up or down on their, on their costs, but um, it's almost entirely just the tank changes. You generate a lot of ult off tanks in our game. Right, I guess there's one less tank to shoot as well, so it makes it right, a true. little bit harder. Although looking at Widow is an interesting example. We haven't adjusted the snipers too much yet, but we're keeping a really close eye on them because a lot of what sort of control snipers is the that fact there's all these barriers you can't shoot through mm -hmm. and you're playing as widow against a comp that is you know like a back in the day when it was like wrecking ball only or something like that like you definitely are a lot more powerful so uh we have yeah. to make sure that they're not they don't get out of control i feel because i feel like on some of these choke points it's definitely a lot more wider than than, than some other maps and i feel like uh you know if unchecked some certain widows could do a lot of damage yeah yeah so yeah, it's just yet another thing we got to keep an eye on with a change like this. Right. I mean, you know, we, we talk about how sort of tanks have changed now to sort of allow them to be more multi-purpose or sort of fill a broader spectrum of roles. Obviously, like, you know, when you have a Reinhardt, you, you kind of know what the player is playing for, right? The shield creates space, right? You, you create space just because the shield exists. And with someone like Roadhog, um, they create space because of the threat of the hook, right? It's not even something that's necessarily, mm -hmm. it's implied threat, right? It's not... Um, exactly. So directly displayed. So, 
I mean, what is the idea for a tank? Do you still want there to be the mix of there sort of being that implied threat plus obviously a, a very visible threat? Uh, you know, has it changed the way you think about how tanks create spaces now? Obviously, all tanks have to be able to do that to some degree, regardless if they have a shield or not. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, obviously, uh, also impacts new hero design, working new heroes, how they're going to act with creating space and defending their team. Um, certainly looking at... Uh, you know, Arisa's not being played here for a reason because we're looking at her really heavily. Sure. Um, any any hero that has sort of that, that just the really kind of heavy static slow defense are the ones we're kind of trying to hit the hardest first. Um, and then, you know, just that alone already makes Roadhog shine a little bit because he's not being compared to the huge barrier Reinhardt. Um, but certainly, oh yeah, well, there <laughs> should have healed there first probably, but you know, he went for it. Um, yeah, so like, there's a lot of changes we can make now in this world that would have been really scary to make before, um, mm -hmm. especially in regards to cooldowns. Uh, so like, Roadhog used to have a much sl uh, faster hook way back in the day. Um, maybe we could bring that back, uh, especially in a world where all the tanks are pretty aggressive. So it doesn't, you know, it doesn't feel like it's super crazy. Uh, we still want to make sure there's enough like counterplay. You want to feel like I made him dodge the hook, and then we had no opportunity to attack and just hooked again right afterwards. So it's certainly a balancing act, but um, a lot of the the tank. Uh, sort of tankiness can be just in the, the hero themselves now because if you get to go in and be threatening like with all this extra damage and just be hard to kill you're just creating space by existing <laughs> what an animal obviously um super i'm curious to get your opinion here obviously it's someone who plays tank right and you know you, you'll play uh you know main tank as we call it or off tank what, what is it that makes you sort of feel most powerful when you're playing tank Right, because obviously the, all the heroes offer something so different to each of them. But could you could right. you narrow it down to something? What makes you feel like um, MTD feel? You know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, well, I feel like a lot of it comes down to like decision making, right? And a lot of that currently is kind of based off of the fact of what your second tank is doing, which is obviously uh, you know no longer a thing because mm -hmm. there's a removal. Um, and I feel like this is really gonna have to rely a lot more on like your support's keeping you a lot more alive as opposed to like your off tank or secondary tank, you know, being in, in coordination with you. Um, because the supports now, they only have to focus on, on one tank in particular. Um, mm -hmm. As opposed to, you know, having to split it between two. And I, I feel like that's probably gonna have to give a lot more... Tanks are gonna have to play a lot more, I guess, assertive mm -hmm. because they can't really rely on on their other tank to, to make the decisions for them or like to you know help them out in that way i feel like it definitely changed i, I know you know there's, there's a, a good handful of players who you know their, their selection of tank really boils down to their capacity to to deal damage uh mm -hmm. you know like a lot of time, like you got you you'll see them right you, you get these weird sort of sigma zaya comps or you see like a lot of people just like playing roadhog that's their favorite tank because he does damage um you know, trying to make you know a, a player feel powerful on tank without just doing damage requires you to really think much more about game design. Oh so my. that's what I kind of wonder. You like, oh. outside of just doing a ton of damage, how do you sort of balance a tank to make them feel powerful without just pumping numbers into their primary fight? <laughs> yeah, uh, um, I feel like that's probably a design philosophy uh, that I'm maybe not <laughs> qualified to talk about. Um, that's actually, well, I don't know. That's I mean, because I wasn't actually asking you, but you can weigh in on it okay, first. Okay, yeah, I'll stop speaking. That's good. No, that's good. I'll stop speaking. <laughs> I'm curious where you're that's getting good. this, but... <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, a lot of it's, like, we're talking about with just options, and, like, you know, Super mentioned, like, we just want to make sure that, I mean, that's the, kind of the point of the Zarya change, is just giving her more flexibility and more options, so, I mean, it happens to be she also generates a crap lot more energy yeah. and is way scarier and does more damage in this case. Uh, we may have to rein that in a little bit. It, she was already running out on that last little bit there with like 80 percent and then 100 percent so you can see it's pretty pretty aggressive but um yeah it's definitely just trying to create um really interesting playmaking opportunities and just strategic thought and i think that's where a lot of people kind of like to have the tanks exist where it's if you really want to just click heads there are probably better options out there i don't think i don't think we're likely to make any kind of like sniper tank out there or anything like mm -hmm. that because you know there's a lot of other opportunities for that um we'd like to try to keep the tanks like like i was mentioning with the crowd control changes as an example of this we like to keep the tanks being the ones who are primarily able to do crowd control and that's also with only being one tank now it means still there's gonna be a lot less crowd control in the game uh, in general but still allow them to, to sort of flex that particular element
Right, so you talk about obviously taking a little bit of that away from May, but obviously it's still something that, you know, you feel like you could include in the game. It almost feels like it's a, a more moderated approach to it now because tanks can can be the ones that bear a lot of that sort of crowd control uh, potential. It just means that there's, you know, now it's just that one hero on the battlefield that really is able to produce so much of that outside of, you know, five different forms that are coming in. So it, it feels like almost exactly. responsibility as a, as, a, as a tank player is, is almost kicked up a notch there because you, you got to be a jack of all trades yeah. in some cases. Especially if crowd control gets reduced to a point where you're looking for a, to counter something specific. Like you're looking for Genji Blade that then, you know, is ready and you're trying, you need to, let's say, playing Hog. You like really want to land that hook when he comes in. Um, it's a really big game changer if you land it. Um, so sort of like make sure it's up and then you save it and try to keep an eye on him. Um, and conversely, if you're a character who is really watching for, you know, like Reaper or something like that wants to get his ult off, but you want to make sure you're not going to get stunned, it's a lot easier to sort of track who who's, can stop you. you know, you're looking for their tank and looking for, um, rather than looking at the whole enemy team. It's kind of like when you're Zarya trying to ult and you, you're watching Tiba really close because you don't want to have it eaten, and that's what you're most concerned with as far as timing goes. It's like that with more CC in general. This guy's it. nuts on Roadhog. Yeah. <laughs> even even with sort of, yeah, less knockback, Ryan obviously being as close as he was to the whole hog just sort of gets knocked away. Um, I, I sort of remember, I almost, it was almost like a tooltip text loading into game, uh, sort of playing Overwatch. It sort of said, like, listen out for footsteps. Like, the heavier footsteps mean your opponent is potentially oh, yeah. more dangerous to you. <laughs> but it definitely feels like, <laughs> you know, the weight of these weapons is much more effectively conveyed, right? If I'm listening here as, as we're sort of talking. Um, like that scrap gun sounds extremely meaty. <laughs> I love the weapon sounds. Yeah, it's done such too. a great job. And they, uh, I don't think especially like Widow. soldier. Oh, widow! Yeah, widow. So yeah, great. widow is the sort of insane. like the echoing sound you shoot in an open space. Mm -hmm. Oh my god, it's fantastic. You really feel like you're actually wielding a very high caliber weapon, right? That that actually has weight and it has a, a sense of kickback and and uh, sort of makes sound. And also like it, based on where you are in the map. You know, the environment, you know, I think this is maybe covered, I think, this time online as well, but it really feels like the environment, we were inside, you know, club, um, in Lucio's club beforehand, and that echo is really much more apparent, right? That, yeah, environment playing a big role in how things sound. And being on the receiving end of Widowmaker's shot, it just feels so much more dangerous hearing the sound. So it, it helps you hide, basically. <laughs>